situation was not to win the tournament, but Inter-Miami certainly expected more than three defeats that sent Diego Alonso's team packing from the MLS is back tournament. This is Miami Total Football Radio. I'm Eric Krakauer, joined by Inter-Miami insider Franco Panizo. And Franco, Inter-Miami supporters are despondent, they're frustrated, and they're looking to you for answers are you intimidated are you up for the task up to the task i'm definitely up to the task i'm going to need uh, a right hand man and eric krakauer here to help me out um we've got a lot of questions to get to later on in in the show but there's a there's a lot to talk about um and we want to do it in 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 the shorter span because we want to start condensing these episodes a little bit more yeah there's plenty to talk about and plenty of questions to answer so are you are you ready eric that's that's the real question i'm ready I'm very ready, and on today's show, we're going to quickly revisit that 1-0 loss to NYCFC, which punctuated Inter-Miami's tournament. We'll share our tournament takeaways, which may be different. We haven't shared them with each other yet, so there could be some some arguing, uh, doubtful. And we'll make an attempt at separating expectation from reality. We're going to try and be your guides um, into what to expect going forward because we know that a lot of you have a lot of questions uh, that need answers too. And of course, that's exactly what we will end this episode with. So without further ado, let's get to it. Inter-Miami kicked off their third game of the tournament, needing a win to harbor any hope of moving to the knockout stages of the MLS is back tournament, but a 64th minute goal from Tajuri Shradi shattered those hopes, breaching a defense that was arguably the only bright spot for Miami. Well, at least that's my take. Franco, where do you stand on that? On the overall game or on, on your, uh, your bright spot, the bright spot first. Oof. Um, I thought the, the back line, uh, overall showed improvement. I thought Nico Figal was, again, um, fairly solid. Uh, the attack left a lot to be desired once again. Um, and I'll, I'll say this very quickly. I touched on it in my, in my post-game uh, grades piece on SBISoccer.com. Inter-Miami seemingly played around the center midfield spots. They played around Victor Ulloa and Will Trapp. Um, I noticed on, when watching the game the first time that they both were largely invisible. I don't know if you had that same that same uh takeaway but i went later on and looked at the stats and they both had very limited touches they both finished in the bottom three for inter miami in touches and i think that was by design i think uh diego alonso wanted to play through the wings again didn't want them to to get caught in possession against a nycfc team that was strong in the middle so i think they've been very susceptible to criticism and, and rightly so but i think on this one they were qu- they were quiet more by design than by their individual performances but yes there weren't very many bright spots you've been pointing the finger at trap and uyoa all tournament long mostly at trap issues building from the back lack of possession never really able to assert the game that diego lonzo had noted when he took charge of the team that he was going to try and implement the blueprint that he was going to bring with him from Mexico. We haven't seen any of that in this tournament, and we certainly did not see it against NYCFC. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's been some people, and I, I can I guess I can agree to it to an extent. There were some moments in that second game against the Philadelphia Union where you started to see the team uh, knock the ball around a little bit more, but look. Philadelphia Union are not necessarily a team that wants to have possession, so and they had the lead at the time, so that lent itself to um, to Inter Miami having the ball and being able to play its its style a little bit more. Obviously, they get a goal from that, and it's it's encouraging and it's a sign you want to build off of. But look, it's that wasn't there wasn't enough of that over the course of the tournament over the three games. There hasn't been enough of that over these first five games. There's been a pandemic, um, an unprecedented p- pandemic that Inter Miami has to go through, so that obviously hinders the ability to, to gain chemistry and work on things. But Paul McDonough said before the tournament started, he wanted to see progress. And if there was progress, it was very minimal from Inter Miami in this competition because overall the team just did not look very good over the course of three of the three games. Well, I, I don't think there was much progress at all. And I and looking back at that second game so against I said, Philadelphia. I said, if, I said if, I said if. No, you did, you did. And, and I'm not disagreeing with you. Um 
if anything, I'm just underscoring the point that you made. And if we are going to take a 10 to 15 minute period in the second half against Philadelphia as some sort of beacon of light that there is progress being made, then I don't know what we're going to call progress here or how do you even measure progress? Because I don't think that's it. If you're playing three 90 minute games and it's only a 10 to 15 minute period where you're actually playing the possession style that you're supposed to, that's not progress to me. Now, I'm not necessarily putting this on Diego Alonso. I think there's a lot of factors that play into this. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, when I give you my my takeaways. But I look at this team, the first to get bounced from this tournament only because they were in Group A. And I can't necessarily look at it and think, ah, I've seen some development in this area or in that area. I saw little bright spots in every game. And defensively, I thought that, you know, you take Roman Torres, for example, against NYCFC. Did he look like he was laboring a little bit during that game? Yes. But did he have a good game? Yes, as well. So my, if I were to say that, there, that there's progress, perhaps progress in individual performances, but not necessarily in in, in a team unit uh, sort of uh, way or in in, in that uh, team uh, cohesion side of it. Yeah, I, I agree with you again. From a, a team perspective and and the ability, the function of the team and whether you know they can play their style and dictate the tempo and all that, I didn't see uh, a whole lot. Uh, I think in the NYCFC game, you did see the team press uh more effectively at times but in terms of keeping the ball and and creating chances it just it just wasn't enough and i think uh a big takeaway for me is it's clear and it's been clear and they've said it publicly they want a number nine they want to sign a striker although lately there's been talk about maybe that being a winger not necessarily a striker but it, it's clear they need a number nine. But to me, even more so, a bigger takeaway from this tournament is that they need a center midfielder. Um, a number eight, like they've talked about, that can help them connect attacking sequences that can build from the back to the front, that can be the type of player that convinces them that they don't have to play around the center midfield for a given game against, you know, let's say New York City FC like we saw in that group stage finale. They badly, badly need... Um, a center midfielder maybe as much as they need a a goal scoring star striker because it's not like anybody that played striker in during this tournament blew a bunch of chances or uh you know failed to finish a bunch of clean looks i mean you could argue julian carranza had a couple um in the in the second game but Overall, it's not the ball wasn't getting to the strikers. There weren't uh, there weren't a plethora of opportunities for these strikers to score goals, and that's because there's just not the buildup's just not there. The team's just not playing that way or not playing well enough to to create chances for for the forwards from the run of play. So I think it's badly badly needed. Uh, a center midfielder is badly badly needed for Inter Miami. So you're already on the takeaways uh, of this tournament, and that's one of them that a center mid is is badly needed. So I guess let's let's move to that. Unless you want to add anything in particular about that game. Do you want to look back and think of anything that you want to highlight? I know that you thought that Nealis had a pretty good game. Uh, and Nealis was the player who was burnt in the first game in the last 10 to 15 minutes by Nani on the left after essentially shutting him out. He was left out of, of the 11 in the second game, back in the 11 for the third. And for you, one of the players who handled himself well. Yeah, so uh, I know you just like name dropping Nani as much as you can, and he's actually been a very good player during this tournament. So um, did you see his almost <laughs> assist? The I other did. Day? I did. Yeah, <laughs> the, the teammate blew a uh, blew the shit, blew the ensuing shot. But uh, Nealis, yes, um, I thought he had a bounce back performance. I think he's the starting right back going forward. He's not the best right back in MLS, as I wrote for SBI Soccer, but he is the best right back Inter Miami has. I think me and you both touched on after the the Philadelphia Union game, that it might have been a bit harsh for them to to sit Nealis just because he had a, a poor finish to the first game against Orlando City. Yes, obviously he's at fault partially or directly for both goals that Orlando City scored in the opener. But in the first 70 minutes, he held 90 in check pretty well. So, And again, at this point, it's not like you have uh, unlimited resources to go sign players and go trade for players you know there's there's a salary cap in MLS you have to make do at certain positions with what you've got I think Dylan Dylan Nealis based on what we've seen so far is 
going to be the starting right back for the majority of these games. Is he going to be perfect? Probably not, but he gives you uh, a capable player. He's able to defend. He's able to get forward, um, and he will grow. Obviously, he's a rookie. He's only played three games, uh, three or four games to, to date in his career. So professionally, so he will grow. I think he's he's he was a solid performer. I liked Figal. Uh, against NYCFC, Robles, Robles bounced back. I thought Robles he he made the one save he he needed to make. Um, and obviously, couldn't you can't blame him on the goal. There's not much he can do there. But there were some better individual performances. But again, as a team, um, plenty to be desired. Yeah, if you got looking much more comfortable back in the heart of the defense as opposed as uh, to the right back position where he looked a little bit awkward, um, shuttling up and down his his corridor. And 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 Nilas has a. a a high ceiling, I think, um, and by by high, I'm talking about MLS expectations here, not uh, national team or, or going to Europe. But he, he he's a kid who still has a lot to learn, and, and and I certainly think that he showed that he's got all the ability to be the starting right back uh, for this team. Well, let's talk about the ta- takeaways because you and I have different takeaways from this tournament. You mentioned one, and that is the need for a number eight somebody who is going to be a crucial part of the build-up game for inter miami as one seems to not exist right now and i agree to a point but i will say this you look at somebody like will trap and the system that he was in at columbus playing behind iguain who's now at dc united and alongside artur who is a a, a better player than victor Ulloa, but in this a similar player to Victor Ulloa, in that he's the guy who's going to do a lot of work. He's going to cover a lot of ground. He's going to free up Will Trap. You sort of have that system uh, if you include Pizarro just ahead of those two, or if you bring in uh, Lee Wynn, who I don't think we saw enough of I- in the tournament. Certainly looked very composed with the ball at his feet when he did uh, jump off uh, the bench. So I- I'm not sure that is the most. Uh, glaring need right now so i'll give you my first takeaway and that is they need a proven scorer you can't depend on inexperienced uh forwards uh, like caranza and uh, robinson and a veteran whose position and is still to be determined and, and by that i'm talking about uh, agudelo who's not a nine he's not a 10 he's somewhere in between but he's not a guy who's going to be a Game in, game out scorer. Nobody really is in this league, but he's not going to be a reliable enough scorer. So I think that the one position that they absolutely need to address is somebody who's going to consistently put the ball in the back of the net, somebody who has a proven record of doing so. And as you noted, it's not like they had a plethora of opportunities in those three games, but when the opportunities show up, you need a guy who is going to be clinical. No, I, I agree that they need a striker. I, don't I hope I don't want anyone to confuse or to think I'm saying Inter Miami doesn't need a striker. They absolutely need a striker. They've talked about a winger recently. They I think that'd be a mistake. I think they need a striker. Um, given that again they can't go and sign a striker, a winger, and a, and a center midfielder. I think their two most pressing needs are a striker and a center midfielder. I just think a center midfielder is as it, it, before it was maybe the striker was the number one necessity now i think center midfielder is neck and neck if there's if striker's 1a center midfielder is uh is 1b because they need they need an upgrade uh, at that position to at least give Diego Alonso more tools to play the style that he says he wants to play now if he can't get them to play with a better center midfielder if he can't make it work then all right then we can ask a little a few more questions about Diego Alonso and and his overall approach but he in order for them to play a more uh, possession-based build up build from the back create chances with the ball on the ground they need a better center midfielder and I know you touched on Will Trapp and he's he's a U.S. national team player but there's a reason why Columbus and Caleb Porter at Columbus crew decided he was you know expendable and traded him to enter Miami because they, well, they brought Nagby exactly they, they, they wanted to go in a different direction now well, yeah, but you're comparing that's that's all well and good I understand that but you can't compare Nagby who is hands down the best player in his position in MLS to a guy like Will Trapp who is a good player uh, if you're using MLS standards if you're going to bring in a guy like Nagby Trapp's not going to play and you can trade him away uh, I, I just think that doesn't necessarily mean that Trap can't do it. No, well, again, 
they need someone that can do it. And I don't think the trap by like trapping Uyo is not it's not it's clear it's not working out. Um even though that's been the one concept for Diego Alonso, he he's gone to them. I have, you know, I'm going off the top of my head, but I think in every single game um that Inter Miami has had, that's been the pairing in the in the middle. Um and listen, Uyoa has been for me slightly above Will Trap in terms of their performance and what they've given to the team to this point. Is Will Trap is Will Trap maybe the more talented player or the better player? Obviously he's he's on the national team. Um yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think Will Trap is a better player overall, but he hasn't lived up to that in these first five games. And again, the reason I, I made that point about you know about Trap and in, in Columbus is because he's obviously seen with good eyes and in, in a positive manner in MLS circles. But Columbus said, you know what, he can only give us so much. I want you know Caleb Porter said I want somebody else, and they they made the move. Now he's he's in Miami, and he's not living up to to what he can be. And I'm sure you know if if he had an honest conversation with him, I'm sure he would say you know I could be doing better here, here, and here. Um, but again, he but it's also it's just not it's just not good enough from an individual perspective, and they need to change that sooner rather than later because the sooner they can change that. Uh, the better the team will be. This the center midfielder just has it's been a non factor in multiple games to this point, multiple. Um, so even the DC United game back in week two, back in week two when you know they took the lead and they were playing well, they were playing direct and we talked about that on that on the pod that followed that that game and um, I think which we'll, is something by the way that I want to address in my mm-hmm. in my second take takeaway. But I want you to give us uh, another of your of your takeaways after you finish your thoughts. Sorry, no, to I, no, no, you're good, you're good. Um, look, I think Will Trapp's a good player, and I don't I, like. I think he'll he'll deliver more than he's shown, but he needs to he needs to pick it up because at this point, like I said, Uyoa has done better than him in these first five games, and trap is the better player but he is limited and that, that's i guess the point i was trying to make he is limited he's not necessarily a a, a, a a tackler he's not gonna doesn't have a whole bunch of range to his game defensively so he needs to for him to be impactful he needs to be good at what he's actually good at and that's moving the ball connecting with passes um helping helping uh transition from the defense to the attack and he hasn't been able to do that, one, because his performances haven't been there, but also because maybe the partner next to him doesn't allow him to do that. So they need to get a number eight as soon as possible, as soon as possible. All right. What's your other takeaway? Well, I mean, there's so there's there's expectations in reality. And I don't know if you want to get into that now or you want to. Well, say, let's not get into okay. that now. Let's let's uh, let's move to that in like a, a few minutes. OK. Um, anything else that has to do with the eleven on the field or anything Diego, from a I mean, tactical it's, it's, point of view? It's clear Diego Alonso doesn't know what his best eleven is, and he's still trying to find that out. There's still clearly, and I, obviously it's only five games, but there's still a bunch of tinkering that he's doing across across a number of positions. Whether it's going with a three, you know, a three man backline, a five man backline, a four man backline, Nico Figal at right back, Nico Figal at center back. Uh, Mattia Pellegrini at, at left at left midfielder, um, or you know whether they go three four. Like it's clear that he's still trying to find his best eleven, but in doing so, he like he might be tinkering a little too much. Like uh, another example, Ben Sweat was the de facto starter for so many games. Then we saw Mikey Ambrose um, take that take that starting left back spot in the last match, maybe deservedly so because Ben Sweat didn't have a great game against the Philadelphia Union, but. Again, overall, I just think Diego Alonso has as much room to grow as anyone else based on these these first five games because I think some of his decisions, whether it be lineup, whether it be substitutions, I think there's there's plenty of room for improvement for him as well. And again, that's why I say they need to make these signings as soon as possible, the number nine and the number eight preferably, so that he can have more tools at his disposal and that we can really see what he's capable of with a roster that has top-end talent. Because this team, it, it can be decent on paper, but it still lacks top-end talent. Rodolfo Pizarro is your most talented player. He's a good player, but he's not going to do it all on his own, as we've said multiple times on this podcast. I agree with you. He doesn't know what his best 11 is. He doesn't even know what his best formation is, but I'll give him some advice. And by the way, uh, before people, and I, I don't know if this is happening here, but let's not scapegoat the head coach here. He hasn't had enough time and he has a proven 
uh, winning record in Mexico with more talent than he has at his disposal in Miami, and that makes it a lot harder. It's going to take some time for him to figure out exactly what it is that he needs to do, but I'm going to give him some advice. If Inter Miami want to be a possession-oriented team, they have to play with three center backs uh, to free up based on based on the personnel that they have available to them right now. So if you want to free up Will Trapp and Victor Ulloa, you need to play with three uh, center backs. And I think that that means or, or that proves that the Gonzalez Perez uh, signing is a very shrewd move uh, on the part of McDonough and co there because you have a guy who's won the MLS Cup, a guy who was an integral piece of that Atlanta United team, a leader as well in 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 the locker room. Um, so somebody who's going to bring some some more stability, somebody who has a very good uh, pass, uh, he, he's very good at switching the, the the point of attack, which takes some pressure off the center mids. And I think that if you play with three center backs and you allow whether it's Mikey Ambrose, whether it's Ben Sweat, whether it's Breck Shea, um, and on the right, Neelis or whoever else uh, may be platooning that particular position, I think that you are just going to give a lot more freedom to Will Trapp and Victor Oyo in the middle. Lee Wynn, if he gets more time, it brings Pizarro a little bit more more central. I know that's his position, but he loves to drift uh, to the left left side. The question then becomes: What do you do with players like with a player like Pellegrini, who seems to be better on the wing than he is further further uh, inside uh, the the pitch or closer to the middle channel? But I think that he's a guy who can certainly uh, have a little bit more freedom and per, and perhaps benefit from that. We've seen that Lewis Morgan likes to attack that sort of inner channel as well. So I think that the the 3-4-3 three, three, or some sort of hybrid is the way to go right now, but principally, because um, I don't feel like I, I'm droning on here or I feel like I'm droning on a little bit, principally to free up the middle and to get a little bit more possession because as we saw against NYCFC, part of that bypassing of Trapp and Uyoa I think has to do with one thing that you mentioned, which is they can't, they couldn't, move through NYCFC's uh, midfield, uh, and if there was a turnover, you just don't have the defensive solidity in the middle to make up for the lack of mobility of a Roman Torres. Um, and, well, and that's pretty, pretty much it. All right, let's move on to this whole thing of perception versus uh, reality. There was a perception at the beginning of the season that Inter Miami had a squad capable enough of getting into the playoffs. The reality may not be matching up with perception. So I'll let you sort through that and whatever else you want to add to the perception versus reality mix. Okay, so this is something I want to touch on because I think it's important to understand Inter-Miami. I think it's important to understand MLS. And, and maybe some of our listeners are know this, but maybe not everyone does. So in MLS, expansion teams historically have had a hard time in their first years because of... A multitude of reasons, and that does not include the pandemic that Inter Miami has had thrown into their expansion season. Um, aside from that, Inter Miami came into this season and has come into the, enti- the entire its entire in- existence talking about accomplishing big things. You know, you have Jorge Mas saying they want to be the the best team in this in this hemisphere. You've got uh, I think Paul McDonough is saying that you know they want to compete for an MLS Cup. If not in year one, then definitely by year two, they want to make the CONCACAF Champions League. David Beckham's talked about signing big name players, and that you know that Miami's going to be a place where uh, a lot of players are going to want to come, and none have come yet. Um, no, uh, well, you could you could throw Pizarro in, in the mix there, but no no real global you know superstar. Um, and this 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 quote from Nico Figal to just sum it up kind of made made me raise my eyebrow after the match against uh against New York City FC you know he was asked the question about the team and he 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 said i no one can convince me that this is a bad team okay that's fine that's fair he, but then he went on and said and this is in spanish inter miami es uno de los equipos más grandes de estados unidos this is one of the best teams in mls this team is 0 and 5 they have not won a single game so I don't know how Nico Figal can say that 
Inter Miami is one of the best teams in MLS when they have existed for a mere few months and have yet to win a single game. Like that's just it's just, it's it's mind boggling to me that yeah, the, but that's like, just play, player talk, right? No, I mean, no, it's player I, talk. What, no, 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 no. There's, there's there's a difference between saying like, hey, and unfamiliarity you, with the league as well. Well, but there's a difference between saying, hey, we are a team that's in progress, and you know, we we think we're better than than our record show, which is fine. That's you know, but he said we're one of the best teams in MLS, and how can you say that after you're zero and five? That's listen to me. That comes from the top down. That comes from like I said, everything I just laid out from Beckham's initial press conferences, talking about you know all these big dreams he had. Initially, it was like, oh, we're gonna build a stadium on the water, and like it's again, it's a lot of the, the things that are coming out initially, like the expectations are not really matching up with the reality of situations in MLS. Like you don't you don't just show up to MLS and and kill it uh on the field um more often than not. Look, Atlanta United and LAFC did it, but they are more the exception than the rule. And I know Inter Miami and rightfully so wants to be ambitious and wants to follow in that path rather than the other path. But look, they haven't signed any big names. Again, Pizarro, you can make an argument for him, but they don't have a global superstar um, that's going to ch- change a game on a consistent basis. They're, they're a team that's still very much under construction, and I feel like because of Beckham and because of it being Miami and because it being a city that knows and a market that knows it's it's football, it's soccer, well, I, th- I think that that's leading to unfair... Uh, or not unfair, but unrealistic expectations for what this team can be in year one. And I asked Luis Robles after after the game, after the NYCFC game, if the expectations need to be tempered, given everything that goes into an expansion season and what's happened this year um, that's been unprecedented. And he said no, he didn't think so. He thinks that given the, the, the makeup of the squad and... Um, you know the 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 group and the coaching staff and the and the and the leadership that he thinks that you know expectations do not need to be tempered. So if that's the case, then we need to judge this team based off of their stated goals and that. So like I've seen some people say, oh, you know, it's early. This this has been a tough start for them. Yes, but you know they had a pandemic to go through. And well, okay, that's that's all fair and well and true. But if they're going to say that, you know, they have these high expectations, then we have to judge them off that. We can't judge them off of, like, like they're another expansion team because they're not just any other expansion team according to what they say. So that's that's my sense. That's my two cents on that. They, if they're going to keep, you know, uh, shouting and spouting high goals and high objectives, then that's what that's what we're going to judge them against. And they don't get they don't get necessarily get the leeway of other expansion teams that, you well, know, like Nashville or Minnesota or whoever that right. we've seen in recent years. I, I think you I think you touch on something important, right? And and that is if the organization is talking itself up, is basically admitting that they are a contender, then fan perceptions are gonna align with that. But it's but ultimately this has to do also with the glamour of it being in Miami, the glamour of having David Beckham uh backing the team. That plays into that perception as you noted. And then the club has to sort of walk a fine line between what is the realistic goal or what are the realistic goals and what it is that their branding seems to transmit to 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 the supporters. And, and that can be a, a pretty difficult uh, r- road, I guess, to, to, to navigate, right? Mm-hmm. Because – you're new and you, you know that you have to capture the imagination right away. And what better way to capture the imagination than to promise success? Uh, and then you don't want to overpromise success because if you don't get it, you could lose some fans by the wayside. And I think that is the, 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 the tough position that Inter Miami right now finds itself in. And But what this experience is, in this tournament does is it certainly waters down expectations and you could already see via Twitter, which may not be the best indication of, of supporter sentiment right now, but there was a lot of frustration out there. There's definitely a lot of frustration. Um, and there's a lot of questions and, and we can, you know, get to it really shortly. We've got a lot of questions more than we normally have well, for our Q and a segment that we need to, that we need to get to, because there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of, wonder as to what happens now how does this team get better 
how does this team move forward uh, with the expected remainder of the regular season that's supposed to happen after the MLS's back tournament comes to a close. Um, there's just a lot. There's a there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things people want to talk about and discuss because they want to know what what what's up with this team. What what is the reality and what is what can be honestly expected going forward? And you know, in my coverage and again in our conversations, I, I think we try to be um, as impartial and as as honest as possible. So I think. You know, we can give our uh, as best assessment as we can possibly give as to what we think when, when we get to that Q&A session. Well, why don't we move to that Q&A session right now? All right, Q and A time with uh, Franco and Eric. And Franco, I'll let you uh, read the first question. Yeah, we, we got to get to these because there's quite a bit of them. Um, the first one's from at a Hoyo sixteen avid listener of the show. What's up, Andres? Um, where does Inter Miami go from here? Do expect- expectations change a lot, if at all? Is this part of a Miami sports curse? Well, <laughs> he, the reason he says that is because he 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 gave me a rundown of you know how. In how teams in Miami, professional sports teams, have done in their first seasons it hasn't been very good. But that just speaks to the difficulty of starting a team from scratch and and trying to make it all work together and in any sport. But for Inter Miami, like, like we just touched on uh, in the last segment, Eric, I think expectations need to be changed a little bit. That's my personal opinion. I think they need to be changed. But Inter Miami saying no. Inter Miami saying they're going to keep going with their high expectations for this for this first season and for the overall project. So if the expectations don't change then that's what we judge them. That's what we grade them on. So I don't I don't think that they change at all. Uh, where does Inter Miami go from here? We, we said it. They need to make two signings to round out the roster, and then we can really fully assess them. Then there's then there's no wiggle room or excuse like, hey, okay, well, we don't have this player or that player. Then it's this is the team that we have, and this is you know what we on the outside can judge them on. Yeah, you're assuming there's going to be a remainder of the season, by the way. No promises on that front after MLS is back. Okay, second question. Calypsonian, what do you think is the easiest thing to fix with this team? I'm going to give you a straight, short answer. There is no easy fix. Uh, As Franco alluded to before, that expansion teams uh, traditionally have a lot of trouble, particularly in the first season. We're going to see that again. It's going to be a lot about chopping up the team, figuring out the best 11. We've also talked about Diego Alonso not knowing what his best 11 is, what his best formation. This is going to be, I think, based on MLS is back, a difficult season again if we have uh, if, if we still have a season going forward after the tournament is all said and done. All right, let's go to the next question. I'll take this one again. This one comes from Diuyoa23. Any info on dates to get season started after the tournament concludes? So, so there actually is. There actually has been some dates that have come out. Um, the Athletic reported that at the end of August, so around August 22nd, that's when the resumption of the MLS regular season is expected uh, to begin, potentially in some markets with fans in the stadium where that's allowed or permitted so there is that is that was the plan that was laid out prior to mls is back that's i didn't hear specific dates on my end but i had heard that the idea was to resume the regular season after the mls is back tournament with nine home games nine away games obviously uh as close or as regional as possible um and that's you know that's stuff the athletic uh has has reported in in their in their story um and again it starts it's it's tentatively scheduled to start august 22nd and the athletic also touched on they're gonna there's gonna be two phases in 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 the in the regular season resumption the first phase will be i forget, i don't have the exact dates right here but the first phase will be a certain amount of dates and that's essentially to allow the canadian teams to play each other multiple times because they're not uh, yeah the border is closed correct so, <laughs> so the border is closed so so yeah. so the second phase would is the idea is that you know by this time the second phase starts that they would be allowed to travel, but you know, in in and out of the United States, um, and be able to compete that way. So that is the plan or the tentative plan as of right now, according to the Athletic. August twenty second is when you should circle your calendar uh, right now. 
Okay, because of time, we're going to have to move on quicker. But my two cents on that, they are crazy if they think that they're going to have a season with the explosion of COVID in this country. So August, get out of here. All right, move on. Next question. <laughs> Eric, Eric came in passionate with that one. Um, all right, uh, so this one comes from at Jimmy J 97 Any word on an established DP striker yet? When I see the early success that BWP is having at LAFC, makes me wish Inter Miami had picked him. Not great, but better than anyone Inter Miami has in that forward playing role. Eric, I'll let you answer this. You're you're familiar with BWP as am I, but um, you know what? What do you think? Well, I've been texting you every time LAFC a play, uh, scratching my head as to why the Red Bulls would let him go. Obviously, still has a lot of quality. I completely agree that this would have been a really good signing uh, for the team, not only for what he brings on the pitch, but also uh, the kind of leader uh, that that he is, the leadership that he showed at uh, at uh, the Red Bulls with uh, with Robles would be a, a, a bonus for sure. All right, next question: Have you heard any rumors about Cecilio Dominguez? Uh, what do you think is a long term formation? that Inter Miami should play given their personnel, 4-2-3-1, 3-4-3, or a 4-3-3 if the club manages to snag a good central midfielder. So two two questions here. Cecilio this Dominguez is, this to Paraguay. Is, this, is from, this is from at Miami Forza. Yes, that is correct. At Miami Forza. My bad. Go ahead. I've, I saw the, I saw the obviously the, the report that linked Cecilio Dominguez. I don't know if that's um, – I think there was more of a report that kind of was putting – two and three together and getting four i don't like i think someone just said hey this, this player is available and you know somebody else was like all right well he could be a player that goes into miami so i'm not sure he's the player that inter miami is after maybe could be but i don't i'm not 100 percent sure on, on on him being the the actual the actual target as for the formation i know eric laid out his formation earlier i would say four two three one is their best look given their personnel now and probably given their personnel going forward. I don't think you have players that can give you good wing back play that can get, can provide that actual comp- competent contribution so on, yeah, on both sides of the ball. I think a four, two, three, one, keep it as, as simple as you can for the players that you have, especially in your one. And then obviously then you can work your way into different things. Once you have a, another off season and a second year to, to, to reinforce the group. Next question comes from at, at JRRC171. Any idea what Paul McDonough will do with the two spots left on the roster? Will he release any players or send anyone to the USL team? Any news on the sponsorship for the kit? Any word when MLS will restart the season? So we already touched on the date that is ex- that the season's expected to start on or tentatively expected to start on. As for the the rest of the roster, like like we said, it's going to be a center midfielder and either a striker or a winger. There has been, you know, there was talk before the tournament that Inter Miami had spoken to William, the Chelsea, the Brazilian winger, and he he denied the the contract negotiation or the offer. So there is a possibility that they go with a winger instead of a striker. I think that'd be a mistake, but it is a possibility. And I do think that they're going to have to do something with one of the players on the current squad because I think they're at 29 roster spots. So to sign two more, they're going to have to move somebody or drop them to a USL team or trade them or loan them out somewhere. That's definitely a possibility. Um, and for the sponsorship, Paul McDonough said the day that they were leaving to Orlando that he couldn't get something done in time for the tournament, but that he expects something to be done before the end of this year. So Jersey spot, Jersey sponsorship might still be on the way. All right, question from Outer Miami. Is Diego Alonso the right coach for this team and for this market that demands free-flowing attacking football? Well, first of all, let's talk about the market. Nobody demands – I mean you can demand free-flowing football, but you get what you get. Okay, One of the things that we've been ruined by over the last few years is this idea of free-flowing football. Very few teams play that sort of football, and if that's what you want to implement and to some degree – Diego Alonso managed to do that um, in in Mexico with Pachuca and with Monterrey, with Rayados. Uh, you need the players in order to do that. And right now, and given what, what Franco has also said, I'm not sure they have the players to play free-flowing football. Hey, I listen. You know, I, I think Miami will is, loves soccer in general, loves football. So I don't – I think that uh, – like – if they win, that'll be the the number one ingredient. But I do I don't think they can just necessarily win by parking the bus or you know playing a, a completely defensive style. I don't think people 
Yeah, but that's well, a far cry from that's a far cry from free flowing football. Correct. Right? This correct. idea, this idea, this romantic idea of free flowing football. Come on, man. Correct. correct. Anyway, LA, I mean, LAFC's pulled it off. So I mean, I, if some people, hey, if that's what some people want to see, then you know, like some people want to see. Positive, I don't blame you know, them. I want to see that too. Uh, I want to see that too. But let's be realistic here, especially for year one. I, 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 yeah. I agree. All right. Next question at Lloyd Hilbrun. Have we gotten the Paul McDonough that built a loser in Orlando City rather than the one that built a winner in Atlanta? Why did this team stock the roster with so many MLS journeymen? Have you seen any evidence at all that Pellegrini is a DP quality player? So there's a it's a mouthful. There's a, there's three there. Um, we the jury's still out on on Paul McDonough. Obviously, it depends on what he does with these two very important signings that will I guess determine what grade he gets in in this first season. As for the 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 roster itself, I mean, that's part of the expansion, the expansion process, the expansion dilemma is that, you know, you have to build a roster from scratch and you, you have only certain methods to do so uh, and a certain amount of money to do so. So you, normally it, it ends up being that you do get some MLS players that um, maybe aren't aren't regular starters or that aren't of uh, a high high quality so that's part of an expansion season it's part of an expansion project in year one i do think inter miami thought that they would be able to get higher quality players off the off the market going into this whole thing but they obviously came to the reality again expectations versus reality that you know they couldn't they couldn't get everyone they wanted or, or attract everyone they wanted without paying uh, a pretty penny. I think they thought Miami, the allure of Miami was just going to win people over in it. And that hasn't, that hasn't necessarily been the the reality of the situation. Um, as for Pellegrini, I think he's like we touched on, I think last episode, I think he's uh up and comer. I think he's shown flashes, but he's obviously still very green, still very young. And be with that, he's going to be very inconsistent. He's a DP in the sense that he's got, he fills a role, but he's a young DP, not necessarily the same as, you know, the Rodolfo Pizarro or the other DP that will come. Got to have to grade him a little bit differently. You know, they, 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 they think he's, he's worth it in the long run. We'll see in the long run if he, if he, fits that billing of, of a young DP. All right, two questions left. A Martinez 1011 asks, what's next for the season? Well, I'll start with this, and then you can add to it, Franco. Get on the practice field. Get your ideas together. Diego Alonso has to figure out his best 11 and what formation works best for him. And then he's going to try and – he has to try and inculcate – his sort of soccer philosophies, which go beyond an 11, they go beyond a formation because those are very rudimentary things in the world of football. Ultimately, it's to try and establish his blueprint. I think it's what you said. They got to get back to work and they have to make these signings. And I know we've said that multiple times now, but that's that's the, that's the that's objective number one right now. Make those two signings before the season resumes, the, 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 the time frame that it's supposed to resume or that they think it's going to resume. Get those two signings in. Even if the season doesn't start then, you have them in camp. You can start their transition to life in the United States, life in Miami, life with the team. That needs to happen sooner rather than later. And the final question here, Midway 1152, at Midway 1152. Now the transfer window opens tomorrow. That's not true. The window does not open until after the MLS is back tournament um, um, starts. Any player you expect to come to Inter-Miami realistically would like to see come to Inter-Miami and or are under the radar signing that can improve this team look i think if we're talking somewhat realistically here like what what's it in the in the realm of x of of possibility i think if they could sign radamel falcao as their number nine i think that they, they should make that move happen there was talk out of colombia a couple of weeks ago maybe that that's that's something that that's on falcao's table unsure how uh valid those reports are but if they can make that happen and bring a player of his quality as number nine. I know there's, he's older and he's had injury issues, but I think that that fits, that fills a, a massive, massive role for them. There was also talk about Sebastian Perez, Boca Juniors center midfielder, who is on the way out at, at Boca Juniors, surplus to requirements. No, it has not been directly linked to, uh, to enter Miami, but I think he could fit that 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 role he's again like Falcao he's Colombian so he has that appeal to the to the community as well and I think he's a he's a center midfielder that fills that void that Inter Miami has so I think if they can you know sign players maybe not necessarily those two guys but guys in their ballpark or in their uh, realm of talent or quality I think Inter Miami will be well off. Radamel Falcao according to reports in Turkey is uh, being put on the transfer market so perhaps good news for 
Inter Miami, although a lot of talk that he will go to the Arabias to make uh, a almost incalculable amount of money. And with that, Franco, we've come to the end of the show. Let me remind everybody that you can follow us on all sorts of social media platforms where you can see Franco. We'll keep you up to date. I was watching some of your YouTube uh, videos, Franco, looking better and better. Uh, so I just uh, I, I should I shouldn't admit this, but I, I just found out that I can uh, actually on my gimbal that I have record, you know, with the phone being front facing, so I can see myself. Because all this time I've been doing it <laughs> with the phone, you know, facing away from me, the screen facing away from me, and I'm just looking at the back of the of the cell phone and hoping that I'm positioned in the middle. Um, so it hasn't been uh, the most conducive to maybe bringing the best quality. But now that I know that i can do that on my gimbal i can flip it around hopefully the the quality and, and everything will yeah. get better and i'll feel more comfortable but I, yeah now I we appreciate just need the to kind find, words yeah now we just need to find somebody who knows what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> well okay hey, man i bought i bought equipment over the the pandemic shutdown like a second mic and stuff to have with you for when we got to the stadium and talk yeah. post game and stuff but obviously you know we haven't been, we, we haven't been able to do that so you no know, but. no and and with that with that let's close close out the show uh, thanks for, for listening. Leave us uh, a review. Tweet us on Twitter. And until next time, big soccer heads. Mm-hmm.